I'm sorry that you can hear me. <laughs> it's gonna be downhill from here. So hold on real quick while I figure out how to share. Not that I don't use this every day. Actually, um, before I do that, let's, um, let's get to know each other a little bit uh, more. Um, I'm interested in the technology since this is kind of a mixed group of folks. Um, has anyone here used Elixir before? Has anyone, has anyone here deployed Elixir to production? Okay, okay, kind of. Kind of is okay, that's okay. Um, so um, I'll get more, more into it, obviously. Um, I've been running production Elixir systems for about five years. Um, my previous company, uh, which is called CargoSense, still picking. I was a CTO of that company for five years and we built our infrastructure. It's kind of a near real-time system for logistics intelligence on top of Elixir and couldn't have been happier. I actually left that company because I felt like I was kind of done. Um, it was working. I didn't really have much more to do. It was chugging along and I was fully vested. So it was time for me to move on and <laughs> find something else. Um, that was interesting and had scale issues and things and GitHub, it definitely qualifies. Um, there's lots of really cool stuff going on here. So um, that's why I made the jump. Um, I'm gonna go switch over real quick. Zoom is being nice. I'll jump here. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Can everyone still see that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's not cutting it off in any weird way or anything like that. Nope. Looks good. Okay. So now I need to put this little window where I can see all of you folks in some place that makes it possible for me still to re read things. Um, okay. So this is called 10 Reasons Why I Keep Choosing Elixir and Phoenix. Why did I choose 10? Um, I have no idea. However, it ended up being a lot harder than I, than I thought of to limit it to 10. Um, that was actually the main, the main problem that I had. Okay, so yeah, that's me. At GitHub, I am just Bruce. I am easy to find there. Um, the benefit of being the 72nd user of GitHub is that I get my first name. Um, that also means that I get all of the notifications for all the Bruce's on GitHub all the time. Um, so anytime that someone tags Bruce, I get it, um, uh, which is, has been interesting. I've, I, apparently there's a bunch of climate scientists named Bruce, which I didn't know about. Um, so I've got to see some research. It was all public. I obviously can't. I'm not looking at stuff that I shouldn't be, but um, there's some really cool stuff. Uh, on Twitter, I was not quite as lucky, so it's W Bruce there. Um, only follow me on Twitter if you really just want to torture yourself because it's all nonsense. <laughs> so I am actually um, from Portland. So I'm, I'm from Southeast Portland actually. So about 11, 11 miles south and slightly east of where you are right now. I actually measured this. <laughs> um, however, I'm not right now. Um, I'm a little bit further south. I'm at uh, GitHub headquarters uh, in San Francisco at the moment. I got pulled down here at the last moment for a summit. Um, and thankfully Nate didn't kill me. Um, and we were able to arrange this, which is very nice. So I am sorry that I'm not there. I wish I was, I would actually really like to meet uh, some of you folks. Um, well, all of you folks, I haven't picked any of you out specifically yet that I don't want to meet. Um, <laughs> that's later. <clears throat> That'll be, that's regret later on. Um, but at the moment, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to go up there, uh, maybe at your next meeting and meet more of you. So. Uh, as I said before, I've been using uh, Elixir for about five years. Um, fairly early in the game. Uh, it is, has now taken off quite a bit more. I'll talk more about adoption a little bit later and how I feel about how Elixir has been adopted. Uh, as Nate mentioned, uh, I'm the co-creator, co-maintainer of Absinthe, uh, which is the GraphQL toolkit for Elixir. Um, it was something we put together at CargoSense because we wanted a GraphQL API, we wanted it to be fast, we wanted to make use of uh, Erlang OTP under the covers, and we wanted to um, 
we wanted to make it happen our way. And so we built Absinthe um, and then a bunch of people decided they wanted to use it. So now I have a Slack channel with 2000 people asking me for things, um, which is a really good time um, on a daily basis. Um, and a related note, if anyone would like to learn Elixir and hang out on that Slack channel, answer questions for me, I would be appreciated. So, um, that's Absinthe. I also wrote a book about Absinthe uh, that was published by Pragmatic last year with my co-author, uh, Ben Wilson, um, who is the lead developer at CargoSense. I guess now director of engineering. Um, I like to dabble in languages. My background is in linguistics and semiotics, um, which is to say that I'm a language nerd and um, I pick up languages um, all over the place. Most of these I've used in some capacity in the last six months. Some of these are almost jokes that I tossed in that I have used before. Um, so a fair amount. I've actually written an embarrassing amount of Lua in the last month because I've been working on Minecraft stuff with my sons. Um, and uh, I like a lot of the languages in here. Some of them I like slightly less. I wouldn't recommend you write uh, tech code for LaTeX uh, anytime soon, for instance. Um, but I do love languages. And so some of the stuff that I'll be talking about will come out of my love of languages in general and what I think um, about Elixir um, specifically and its use in Phoenix. So the scope of this, um, inevitably whenever I put together a talk, I put together too many slides with too much stuff. I've been doing this for a long time and I haven't gotten any better at that. So I apologize for that. Some things that I will not be talking about if you're familiar with Elixir in this, uh, in this talk is I'm not gonna talk about how awesome the pipeline operator is, even though it's very, very awesome. I'm not gonna talk about uh, data pipelining, which is a term that people use about uh, pushing data using the pipe operator. I'm not gonna talk about immutability very much, even though that's also great. Um, and obviously a core feature, uh, language feature. Uh, I won't be digging too much into the compiler stuff, especially um, uh, with relation to the types and type specifications. Um, that's all really cool, useful, interesting stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I wanted to talk more about the foundational parts of Elixir uh, that make kind of day-to-day -day life with it once it's in production um, comfortable. So I put my video in the wrong place. Hold on, while I move this so I can read things. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is mix. Um, Mix is the build tool for Elixir. It comes out of the box, you get it when you get Elixir. Um, you can use it to create projects, you can use it to compile projects, test them. Um, people can add on to, uh, it, for instance, if people here have background in like uh, in Ruby, for instance, it's kind of similar to Rake, but kind of similar to the gem command. Um, it's kind of a mix of those things and it's really, really great. And I'll go over some reasons why I think so here. Okay, so like I said, you can generate a project. Mix, new, <coughs> name of the project. It generates all the normal crap that you need, all the normal boilerplate. Um, the formatter, which is really nice. Uh, Elixir has a code formatter these days. Um, your git ignore for you. The mix IDXS is the most important piece here, which is essentially your manifest for your project. Um, and then the rest of the pieces. And then there's some help documentation at the bottom. Mix is, mix is pretty nice in terms of um, giving you hints on what you should do next. This is what uh, mix study access looks like out of a bare recently generated uh, project skeleton. Um, it's very simple. Um, everything in Elixir is organized in modules. So that's the def module that you see up at the top. You'll notice a trailing do at the end of that. That um, that's because Elixir is far more consistent about the use of do than, for instance, Ruby is. So if you've got a def line, you're going to have a do line at the end of it. Um, there's some other examples like case where we use do too. And you have some project definition stuff there. And then at the bottom, you can see some dependencies. Um, that's just some commented out stuff that you get for free, kind of explaining how you would declare your dependencies. By the way, if anybody has any questions, uh, Nate, feel free to. Um, you know, interrupt me. It's cool. It's, it's fine. I'm happy with this being casual. Yep. I will. I do hope to have time at the end for questions too. Um, but if something jumps out at you and you feel like we can't move forward, um, 
with you remember, you know, and uh, you'll forget something, let me know. Built-in help. So if you type mix help, as you might expect, you get a list of all the tasks that you have available to you using mix. There's a ton of them out of the box and you can add on to them. Um, I only wanted to grab a few to show you the top list. It's pretty extensive and they all individually have help documentation as well. So if you type mix help archive, for instance, you'll see information about archives. Um, the, you can also use Mix to generate a Phoenix app. There's a, you have to install the Phoenix archive to be able to do this. Uh, archives are essentially like prepackaged mini applications that are used by Mix um, for lack of a better explanation. But this will uh, generate a Phoenix app from scratch. Um, and it's kind of some, it's very similar actually to what a normal, um, what a normal new Elixir project looks like but it has some of the conventional directories that you might expect in a web application. So for instance, if you're familiar with Rails, it's a very similar structure, um, at least at the top level. Okay, and it will go ahead and fetch and install your dependencies for you too. It sets up all your database stuff, what you might expect. There's a bunch of command line switches. So if you wanna use uh, MySQL instead of Postgres, um, or if you have, if you don't need a database or if you don't want Webpack or whatever, um, you can you can uh, change those flags. So you can get your dependencies just using mix get. You can test using mix test. You can start your Phoenix server if you're in a Phoenix app um, by doing mix phx server, which I always type serve and then it tells me no, you should use server. Um, and then you can get a REPL at any time. IEX is similar to, for instance, like IRB. Um, it's just a REPL that you can, that you can, uh, you know, type in and do the whole read eval print loop thing. Uh, in this case, this dash s mix means that it's going to load all of the uh, environment information out of mix. So all of your dependencies, all that code will be available and you can call it uh, directly. So that's just a nice thing to do. You can also type uh, iex dash x mix at phx dot server, and it will run the server and give you a REPL so that you can actually interrogate the running state of the application live, uh, which is usually how I run a server locally when I'm developing. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's a tool called Distillery that lets you package up your Elixir application uh, to be released. Um, it comes with uh, a release task that you can call that does that bundling for you. And so that's in there too. And um, mixed tasks are extensible, uh, highly extensible. You can add in your own project, you can add as many mixed tasks as you want. All you have to do is namespace them appropriately um, and you're off. Uh, you can also test them too, um, which uh, a recent addition to our absinthe team is now testing our mixed tasks, which I find extremely nice. So uh, this one, however, is pretty useless and I don't recommend you add it to your project. So next, Hex. Hex is the package manager for Elixir. Um, it's also the package man manager for Erlang um, because of course Elixir is sitting on top of Erlang OTP, which is the VM. Uh, or ERTS, is, as it's also called, which is the Erlang runtime system. Um, and Hex, um, it's, a, it's actually really nice culturally within um, the Elixir and Erlang communities who kind of come together and we use Hex. There's also something called Rebar, which is a build tool uh, specific to Erlang. Um, but packages are all distributed on, on Hex. So there's a website for Hex, it's hex.pm. You can go there, you can see all the packages, you can search and find them. Um, you can see who, you know, who wrote them, all the normal things that you'd expect. Uh, you can see at the bottom, those are the current statistics on Hex. So about 10,000 packages, um, uh, almost 3 million downloaded yes yesterday. And um, it's chugging along pretty well. I have a lot of packages in, in Hex because uh, I haven't learned less than that once you create packages um, and share code, you have to maintain it one of these days. Um, the hex docs website as well so when you push a push a new package to hex uh, it'll generate uh, documentation for you i believe you can opt out but no one does um, and that documentation looks pretty good it has some searchability we've done some special things with absence so that we have these, this guide structure 
um, we've been able to define that in our mix study excess, which is also uh, one of the benefits of being able to use mix for this. And you can um, generate these docs locally, of course, as well. So um, if you want to learn about absinthe, you just have to go and look at the package docs and we have basically everything from there. Uh, Hex is integrated with mix, so there's a bunch of mix tasks for it. It doesn't have its own executable, um, which I actually really like everything basically that you need to do with Elixir, you're going to be running a mix command for. And so uh, there's, a, there's a ton of things. Actually, this is the full list for, for Hex, I believe. Um, but for instance, on most, most days, what you're going to be running is probably mix hex.publish um, or after you log in. So, and there's some things here too for private packages. So uh, one really nice thing about Hex is that there's a specification for how the um, package manager works, so the actual registry. Um, it uses uh, protobufs actually for part of the, uh, part of the API. And it's specified there. Uh, another cultural thing um, that I love about Elixir is that our package manager hasn't splintered into a bunch of competing um, CLIs and, and package managers, and there's not any kind of infighting between different teams. Um, there's no bad blood. Um, so everything's chugging along pretty nicely. And so you can take a look at how Hex actually works um, by checking out that specification. And actually, the code for most of the code is open source as well. I think there's some pieces dealing with um, private repo that's not. OK. So processes. Um, when people talk about Erlang and Elixir, this is the, one of the very first things they always think about is our, our processes, um, which are a little bit different than what you might think of if you come out of um, the world of C, um, or even if you come out of, you know, more more modern languages, um, Ruby, for instance, they're, they're very different because there's lots of teeny tiny processes. Is the way that it works in Erlang and Elixir. So this is the this is the official documentation line about what uh, what processes are. Uh, the main thing to know here is that. Um, processes aren't these special things. Um, you're running in a process at all times. It's not like a thread. There's no threads. Um, everything is a process. You, your main application has a starting process, and then you can you have a tree of processes that are all interrelated. Um, that makes up your application. Um, so, and most of one one of the things that I, I think is important to point out with Elixir versus versus other languages is it takes concurrency and parallelism um, very seriously it's not it's structurally part of the vm rather than it's just something that you can call that you can chain it's not like a promise um, it is it is much more uh, the way everything works um, and that consistently that consistency yields a lot of benefits the process overhead itself um, is very small. So the base overhead is essentially a process is going to cost you about 2k um, in terms of your RAM usage. And it is, you can run hundreds of thousands of these on a machine without any degradation. Um, it ends up being kind of amazing how many processes that you can kick off. There's, there's a number, you can go Google and find people trying to, you know, fill their system of processes, they can get up to quite a significant number. Um, in, in practice, I probably, I might run a couple thousand processes. It just kind of depends on, depends on what I'm doing. Um, but for our data ingestion system, we had something in that, in that kind of range. And there's some links on the bottom here too, in terms of the reference manual and efficiency guide that are really useful to read, give you a lot more background. Um, the main thing to remember with the processes is that they're a lot lighter than with other languages. They're significantly lighter than, um, you know, than, well, than Ruby's um, processes or threads. Um, you can just spawn them all willy-nilly for all kinds of things. Um, ERTS, Elixir, has a scheduler. This is what keeps actually schedulers multiple, um, depending on the number of cores that you have on your machine. Um, these are preemptive schedulers. They keep things running on time um, versus a kind of a cooperative scheduling mode. I'm not going to go into depth about our scheduler and dirty scheduler uh, and handling different things, but um, 
Erlang's been around for 20 plus years. So there's a lot of, there's been a lot of work put into the scheduler and how it operates. Um, <coughs> it's kind of a best of breed when it comes to um, and orchestrating a ton of processes at once. Uh, one thing to note too with the, with the scheduler is if you're running on a machine with a bunch of cores, you're gonna use all those cores. Like you can use them. You can make use of your entire machine. You're not stuck on a core. You're not running node, right? So you can, you can make use of a lot, a, a lot more of your cores. Um, so in this example here, you can see that you're actually in a process. There's a function called self that'll tell you what your process ID is. Um, you can check to see if a process is alive by passing the process ID to it. Obviously, we're in a process, so we are alive. You can spawn a process by using a function called spawn. Um, you pass it uh, an anonymous function, which is what the fn that is there, with the arrow. Um, in this case, that, um, that process immediately executes and exits, which is why the process is no longer alive the next line. So that's how you spawn. Um, importantly, the way that processes uh, communicate is with a mailbox. So they send messages to each other. Um, they, without getting too deep into, into the way um, that the VM works, uh, they, they don't really share memory. They push, they push um, messages around into mailboxes and receive them. So in this case, for instance, I'm, I'm sending myself a message. Send is another function. You give it a PID and you give it a message. The message in this case is a, a tuple uh, with an atom hello and a binary or a string uh, world. And you can see the return value of that um, is just the message that you sent. And then you can see directly after that, I'm receiving. And this receive block here um, is a bit of pattern matching. We'll talk more about pattern matching in a little bit. Um, and if I got hello in a message, then I return message from that block. And if I got world in a message, then I return a string that won't match. And you can see that it says world because I sent hello and then world. Um, in practice, a lot of the time you're not actually sending, doing the send and receive stuff yourself. Um, there's a bunch of tooling um, that sit on, sits on top of it that you can use, but this is kind of the lower level process work. Uh, in this example, we're actually dealing with two different processes. So I'm getting my parent PID, and then I'm spawning a child, and then I'm having the child send a message to the parent PID. Um, and then in the parent, I'm receiving that message directly afterward. And there's things that you can do with that receive block. You can have timeouts. Um, you can essentially have it receive in a loop, so it times out, and then it goes and does other work, and then it comes back to the receive and checks the mailbox. But that's this is kind of core process management stuff. Um, in ERTS. So that's how the messages are sent. And they can be linked. This is one of the most important things uh, to understand about Elixir and Erlang, is that uh, if I start a process and it blows up, uh, I'm not gonna care about it. Right? Like I'm, I can start one up and it might blow up, maybe I don't care. Um, it's just kind of a fire and forget. However, there may be cases where you really care that that thing blows up. Um, and so there's a, another function called spawn link, which links this process to that process. And so if it exits, then I have to deal with it. Uh, just like if the, essentially as, as if the exception occurred in this process. And so um, we'll talk about supervisors in a second that's very related to how that works. But in this case, I'm just spawning another process and I'm immediately raising in that process. And you can see that it exits and then the parent process exits as well. This would actually exit the shell because the, the top level process exits. So they can be linked. And they can have state. So in this case, here's a module. This module has a function called start link. Um, you can see task there. Task is just a fancier wrapper around, uh, around all of the spawning. Um, it gives you better error messages and things like that. And in this case, a task is going to start a process that's going to loop with a map. And it's just going to sit and loop and loop and wait. So this is like a little key value server that's just going to sit there. It's a little process that's going to hang out and it's going to wait for messages and then it's going to do things with those messages. So in this case, you can put a value into that state and you can get a value from that state from outside of it. And there's an example of that being worked. Uh, 
Hold on. Oh, no, I don't have the example. I'm sorry. I thought I did. Um, oh, no, oh, I do have it. I just don't have the part where I initialize it. But I can put a value and I can get a value out of that state. And flush is a little helper that lets you dump everything that's in the mailbox. If this is all, if, if this all sounds a little arcane and complicated, um, take heart in the fact that you don't actually have to write most of this code most of the time. Um, this is stuff you sit on top of. So you get a lot of benefits of this without having to do it day in, day out. That is a very powerful concept. Okay. So supervision. Uh, I talked about a tree earlier. So a supervisor is essentially a module that watches a bunch of processes. So in this case, there's like a KB registry that it's watching. Um, and importantly, the supervisor has rules about what happens when that thing dies. So before, when I did a spawn link, you saw that the other process died, and then I died, and that was no good. In this case, um, if that KB registry dies, you can see at the very bottom line there where it says supervisor init strategy one for one. If that KV registry dies, it'll just get restarted. It'll just start another one. That's exactly what will happen. There's a bunch of different strategies. Um, there's a number of retries. Um, this is why people call Erlang fault tolerance, um, because you have these trees of supervisors. You can have a supervisor watch supervisors watch supervisors, and they all have workers underneath them, and they do work. And if you have a worker blow up, then that supervisor knows how to handle that case. So should I restart it? Should I restart it three times and then exit? Should I exit immediately and let my supervisor know that bad things happen? Should I do some type of self-healing? Um, this is why uh, Elixir and Erlang, well, especially Erlang systems have been known to run for years, um, provided they don't lose power. But uh, anyway, so this, this whole tolerance is a key feature. In your application itself, there's a top level module for your app if you create a Phoenix application um, that does this for you. Um, that you can part, put your own supervisors inside that children and you can set up strategies and your application when it starts will start those supervisors or just start various pieces of your app that'll run. When you run a Phoenix app, a lot of the stuff is already built for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you want to build your own data ingestion system, or if you want to have your own Redis clone that's actually written in Elixir, um, then you can just add that into the supervisor tree, and then that will be handled. So that's what a supervisor is. Clustering. Clustering takes it a level higher. Um, my first entry into Erlang was um, when I went to this... Uh, it's called Scotland on Rails. It was a, an early Rails conference in Edinburgh. And they actually, for some reason, had someone come to the conference um, and speak about Erlang. It was uh, from a startup called Hypernumbers at the time. And I remember one of the things that really stuck to me, stuck in my head um, from his talk was when he said in the beginning when we were writing programs, we were writing it directly on bare metal. And then we decided that we wanted to have an operating system and that would make it easier to write programs. Um, and now, because of the distributed nature, because of scale, we, what we really need is something that's unlike an operating system, is more like an application system. So an application that runs across multiple machines. Um, and Erlang has, has taken that idea and run with it. Um, so it has, it has dis distributed Erlang, distributed Elixir, essentially is you can run multiple VMs um, on the same machine, um, across multiple machines um, in a data center. You can connect to those VMs. Um, programmatically, you can connect them. There's tools to connect them. And once they're connected, you can fire off processes on other nodes in that cluster, just as if they were in your existing VM. So you don't, it's, the concept essentially is that they're location transparent, right? So in this case, I am, I am, um, spawning i'm spawning a a um sorry i'm spawning a process on another node here on foo at computer name which is a connected um which is essentially a, it's a connected node to the my current node and then i can get the results from that right um i don't have to care that it's over there necessarily and there's a bunch of tooling in and around um processes and moving processes from um from node to node 
Um, in a Phoenix application, for instance, you might run it in a cluster of, of three or more, um, and that will um, give you the ability to kind of spread load across uh, your machines in a, in a different way than a load balancer would necessarily give you. Or to turn parts of your application on or off on different machines as well. So um, distributed Erlang and Elixir are obviously a complex topic, but it's once you start um, start really digging into scale, it, it becomes important. This stuff is really cool, observability. So I'm gonna to totally misuse the operations term observability here um, to some degree, which will annoy uh, people that work in ops, DevOps uh, kind of world. But um, obviously it goes beyond monitoring. This, uh, you get a lot of stuff out of the box uh, with Erlang um, and Elixir. You can just jump into, uh, you can just jump into your REPL and say observer start. Um, this, that colon observer means that this is an actual Erlang Erlang package, um, an Erlang application. And so I'm going to start the observer and this actually pops up this GUI window here. Um, and you can no you notice at the top there's a bunch of tabs. I'm actually looking at the supervisor tree here, the trees underneath the KV. Uh, you can see the individual PIDs. You can also click on the individual ones and kill them, which is really cool in a production system. So if you want to test, see how well your production system deals with errors, you can actually just remotely connect to your production system securely, and you could just kill a part of it and then see what happens. Um, so it's kind of an interesting way to make life interesting for your workmates um, who suddenly have to deal with a partial outage. So I may or may not have done that before. So the, there's, another, there's a command line interface version of the same thing that you can run, which is cool. It's very curses like and uh, you can kind of dig into this to the same stuff. You can also uh, interrogate the state of individual processes and you can modify the state of individual processes as well. There's also commercial products around this. Um, Wombat OAM, which comes out of uh, Erlang Solutions, which is a packager of Erlang. They have a lot of some of the original Erlang folks there. Um, we tested this at CargoSense, it was crazy. It was an absolutely amazing product that told you way more than we could ever know what to do with um, in Erlang. And it integrates now with a ton of uh, other tools. So if you were actually shipping something, this might be something to look at as well. It was more than we needed because there's so much you get out of the box. Macros. Um, if you like to torture other people, macros are for you. Um, if you have a background in Ruby and you're familiar with how to do metaprogramming, it's similar. It's a little bit safer, I think. Uh, in this case, for instance, um, you can see the def macro, which is the second line, which is, um, and the quote and unquote is the macro piece. So you can essentially write code that writes code for you. Uh, so in this case, that stuff doesn't even, post compilation, the macro, macro, uh, macros get um, executed during the compilation process. So post compilation, if the application environment does not have a logger enabled, you won't have the overhead of it checking. Um, so you, it'll just be a no op when you call logger log and you pass that string to it, just nothing will happen and you won't have any of that overhead. So this is just kind of a short example of how macros work. They get very complicated. For instance, in Absinthe, we have, we extensively use macros um, for actually um, defining your GraphQL schema. You can load it through the normal GraphQL way, but we also have these macros that uh, actually most people seem to prefer um, because they can more easily programmatically generate their schema. So we have things like, in this case, query is a macro, field is a macro, resolve is a macro. And then it's actually during compilation writing a bunch of code for you so that you don't have to. So that's pretty cool. And it's terrible to maintain, but um, that's my problem and not people that are using it who seem to love it. So mission accomplished. Uh, pattern matching. Uh, people love pattern matching in Elixir and for good reason. Um, we don't generally use the word assignment. We usually talk about binding when we talk about setting a variable value to something. And in this case, all three of these lines are setting um, the variable name to the, um, the string Bruce. 
So the first one is simple. It doesn't even look like it's any kind of pattern matching, but it actually is. The second one is extracting that first element out of the list. And then the third one is taking the first element out of a value of a map. And so pulling Bruce out and other names, which would be Bryce and Bryce, which by the way, were what I was going to be named and thankfully wasn't. Um, either one of those. Um, so all of those are equivalent. And essentially, you can structurally match the right and the left-hand side. You can pull values out. That's pretty cool. Um, you can do that in, on case statements as well. So in this case, I'm matching against the list. And the result of this case statement, if the list is empty, will be an atom, uh, no items. And if it's got one item in it, then it will be a tuple of an atom, one item, and the item value itself. And then if it's anything else, I'm going to assume it's got too many items for, for, for me to report. And so I'm just going to return lots of items in the length of the items. This is a totally nonsense example. Um, but it illustrates how case basically works. Um, and if you were to take this a level higher, you can also match on function heads. So if you're familiar with uh, multiple dispatch, um, that's what this is essentially. So in this case, there is one function called put subscription. It takes, it has an area of two, so it takes two arguments. Um, in the first case, if there's a user that, that by the way, is what we call a struct, uh, which is a fancy map essentially, of key value pairs. And um, if the subscription is nil, then I'm going to take the subscription that you've given me and set the subscription on the user. That's what the fancy bit is on the second line. And I'm going to return that. But if the subscription isn't nil, then I'm going to return a tuple of already subscribed and the user. Um, and that all happens at the point of dispatch. So it takes, it takes the arguments that you're passing to put subscription it matches it against all of the function heads, which in this case there's two, and then it picks the first one that matches. And so this can make uh, your code at least a lot shallower. Um, you're not indenting quite as much. Obviously, there's trade-offs and readability that you have to deal with like anything else, um, but it's, um, I really like it. Uh, also, if you are a parsing nerd, um, if you like doing things like unpacking binaries, you can do um, binary or bit string uh, pattern matching in Elixir as well. Um, it's similar to er how Erlang works. So in this, in this case, I'm actually parsing a UDP packet and pulling these individual pieces out. Those get assigned. So I'm unpacking piece a one packet into individual variables, and then I can return a map of those with better names. So um, you can write really, really fast parsers in Elixir because of the pattern matching. Um, that's available to you. And this is only kind of just a few bits and pieces of the types of um, matching options that you have with, uh, with binaries. Phoenix perf. So the performance of Phoenix, it's really fast. Um, people may remember this quote, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned, lies, and statistics. They may even be more familiar with this one, which is micro benchmarks instead of just statistics. So I'm not going to shove a bunch of micro benchmarks at you and tell you that Phoenix is super fast. What I'm going to tell you is to Google these things if you're interested. You know, um, Phoenix has been able to handle 2 million concurrent WebSocket connections on a single machine. That's pretty cool. Uh, Bleach Report switched things over to using um, Elixir and Phoenix and seriously changed um, their scalability characteristics. Discord um, as well. That last one's totally a joke, but I bet you could I bet you could go Google it right now and find a bunch. Because <laughs> so, it's it's absolutely true. I love Rails. I used Rails from the very beginning, and I still use Rails uh, here at GitHub. Um, but Phoenix, um, at least when it comes to speed of the system, not speed of development necessarily, because we're still, <coughs> still building new things for us to use. Rails is obviously a very huge ecosystem. Ruby's ecosystem is very large. Um, but in terms of the actual code that's running, in terms of its um, speed, Phoenix is very, very impressive. And I suggest you dig into that more. Phoenix Live View. This is the last piece. Um, I'm just, if you haven't seen Phoenix Live View before, I don't know if I can actually make this run. So what you're seeing here, since this is a full stack group, uh, this is a UI this, that is being served by Phoenix. Um, there is, 
uh, the developer of this wrote no JavaScript. There's no JavaScript written. Uh, this is all happening from Elixir over WebSocket doing DOM modifications. There's a tiny shim of JavaScript that handles, I think it's called Morph DOM, uh, that handles the, um, the DOM changes. And I'll show you what this code looks like as well. So these, this is some validation. Uh, people have built games in it. Um, and I'll show you a link to some other crazy stuff that uh, people are going to be showing off here soon. So that <laughs> you saw here uh, with this thermostat, we'll take a look at the code for that. Uh, if you're familiar with Rails, you'll be familiar with controllers. In this case, there is an action on this controller called thermostat. Instead of using render, it uses live render. Um, and it renders a view here, which is the way that Phoenix works. Won't go into that really, but that view just happens to be a live view. You can see that on the second line where I say use Phoenix live view. And the rest of what we're going to show is what goes inside of this view. So this is if you if you're familiar with uh, like JSX, for instance, um, it's very similar. And don't worry, you can totally shove this stuff in a separate file. You do not have to have it in line in the Elixir code. Um, but this uh, the L sigil that you see at the top right there is what defines a live view uh, HTML chunk. You'll notice there's some special um, events in here. You can see uh, Phoenix click, for instance, uh, to actually trigger an event. And this is what uh, when you when we watch the animation, when the clicking the uh, clicking was occurring, it was uh, pushing the thermostat up and down, uh, decrement and increment at the very bottom there. You can see. So that's what the render looks like. Uh, you always you have to have a function that's called mount. Um, you see the session there, which we're ignoring, which is like, for instance, if you have to deal with authentication, uh, you would you'd want to look at the look at the session. You want to make sure that the socket is connected. And in this case, this thing is triggering a send after. So um, basically, um, every second it's going to redraw. That's what the the tick is. And then it's some it's, it's assigning some initial values for this. So if I go back. You can see val mode and time. Um, you can see val mode and time in here. You see the, uh, they look like instance variables are familiar for me, for instance. At mode, at time, at val. So those are being set there. Um, this is the tick that we triggered. This is happening every second. So like a, like a set interval, this is, this is kind of, uh, this is like linking set timeouts where once the timeout causes another one to happen, this is a send after here causing another tick. Um, and in this case, all it's doing is reassigning what the time value is. And then these are the event handlers um, to actually handle the user input, so the individual clicks, um, the increment, decrement, and the toggle mode, um, switching between tooling and heating. And that is it, um, obviously, besides the CSS that I'm not going to show you. Um, but there's no, if you were writing this, if you were building this, you would not have to with a line of JavaScript. This isn't to say that this is going to kill, uh, you know, client-side JavaScript. That's not happening. Um, but you know, leave it to backend developers to avoid JavaScript at all costs. So um, this is this is one way to do that. Um, and it's extremely fast. Um, uh, well over 60 frames per second, for instance. You can really you can actually build relatively decent small games with this. Um, and this again is thanks to Phoenix. Uh, these are some early, this is from December of last year, some just some early um, numbers on the, the little JavaScript shim that you have to have for live view, which is the live view by JS and the Morphon versus, you know, view and react and Ember. Obviously, those have all, um, all of these have um, changed since then. And I have no idea whether they've gotten bigger or smaller, but um, that gives you an idea of scale. Um, and this is happening right now. Um, if you are interested in live view, uh, this Phoenix Frenzy here um, is a competition uh, where you can enter it and try to build a really cool live view demo. And uh, they're not going to give you anything for it, but it's going to be cool. <laughs> um, and uh, presumably, these will be kind of packaged and, and shown as demos for, for people that are interested in Phoenix. And they'll be available to, to actually go look at um, at the site once, once it's done. I think it's got something like 40 days left. Or something like that. And I believe you can still register. And this is a pretty cool thing. I've built a couple um, small live view things and they're really fun to build. 
and they're fun to test too. So some quick words on Phoenix adoption. Um, when I talk to people, because Phoenix has been, you know, well, not Phoenix necessarily, but Elixir has been around, um, you know, for a few years now. Uh, and when I talk to people, especially people that came out of the Rails community, um, I started learning Ruby in 2001. And so I was there long before Rails was. Uh, and so I was, I was part of the community as it, you know, did a hockey stick of growth um, and grew extremely fast. And so from people that I know from that period of time, they always wonder like, why isn't Elixir doing that? Or why isn't Phoenix doing that? And my point that I usually tell them is just not to worry about that. There's a, there's a big, uh, there's a difference of inducements between Rails and, um, and Phoenix. Uh, with Rails, it was development speed primarily, the ability to build something really fast um, coming out of having used Java before um, of some of the other tools that were available. That was the primary push Speed was definitely secondary. Um, what I actually think the growth in the Elixir community is healthier. I think that I think that people that are looking at Elixir and Phoenix have a different kind of problem to solve, and these problems are problems of scale and problems of performance, um, and problems of maintainability. And so I think that the growth that's happening in the Elixir and the Phoenix community um, is actually very very healthy, um, and it actually is it is growing actually at a pretty good clip. It's just not doing a hockey stick thing that I think some people expect from every new technology post Rails. So that's my words there. Um, thank you very much.